Welcome to this session on Othello uh, for A-Level uh, AS and A2. Uh, my name's Mr. Corfi. I'm a director of subject uh, for NET English. And in this session and the following sessions on the different acts in Othello, uh, we want to focus on uh, the language and structure that Shakespeare uses, drawing off your knowledge uh, and experience of GCSE Shakespeare, but then moving forward into A-level and more of a deeper dive into what Shakespeare does here. So that's what we'll do here in this session on Act 1 and in the subsequent sessions on the other acts. Now before we begin reading Act 1, uh, let's first of all consider Iago and in particular Iago's language. Um, Iago is the malcontent is very, very important as a character. And so, first of all, we can think about his manipulation. Uh, he seems to create his own expressions. These are uh, expressions that uh, aren't in the kind of vernacular of, of Shakespearean times, but they're ones he invented himself and used for persuasive effect and persuasive devices. He will often use animalistic language, and we'll look out for this as we read Act 1. So bestial images, imagery of, of beasts, uh, particularly of animals mating. So he mentions ewes, horses, goats, monkeys, dogs, uh, to emphasize his kind of baseness uh, and how, how he kind of has this um, belief that humans are animalistic in nature. Uh, he speaks in prose, uh, so his speech is quite colloquial, quite, uh, quite normalized. Um, and so that makes him more of a, a kind of informal, relaxed character and thus more approachable and thus more uh, manipulative, particularly when he's talking to Rodrigo, we'll notice this. And it's in direct contrast, as we'll look at in a moment, with Othello. Uh, images of base physical functions. So he is depraved and shows that in terms of the way he speaks. He particularly focuses on money and trade, again with uh, Rodrigo as he continually asks him to make or tells him to make money and it shows that he's much more practically minded in a again in a juxtaposition with a fellow who's far more kind of a, a, a bit blue sky thinker and finally anti-heroic language his language is plain it's direct and understated he does remain in control of his language throughout the play it doesn't change um, again in contrast to Othello uh, and he uses insinuations, subtle hints, questions, indirect accusations and so those who study A-level language it would be interesting to look at Iago's language and the way in which he uses tag questions and other linguistic devices to get his way and, and ultimately um, change Othello's mindset. So we, rather than looking at the whole of Act 1, we're going to look at individual key moments and scenes that I think will be useful in terms of A-level perspective and the assessment objectives. So here we pick up with Rodrigo and Iago having a conversation. And before we even read any of the words themselves, just look at the, the words on the page and the amount Iago is speaking in contrast to the amount Rodrigo is. Rodrigo having these short little lines and Iago has this enormous piece of speech and he, he dominates the, pa play, uh, the page because he ultimately dominates the play. It's all about his dominance um, and, and that being the cause of tragedy as the malcontent. So Rodrigo says, I would not follow him then. And Iago says, oh, sir, content you. I follow him to serve my turn upon him. So he's revealing here his uh, inner motives in following Othello. And that's, this is a key quotation that I would learn for the exam. Um, I follow him to serve my turn upon him. In other words, the only reason that I'm following Othello is so that I'm serving myself. Um, and that's uh, the kind of reveal of his deception straight away. We have no... Um, uh, no other way to look at Iago than as a pure deceptor. We cannot all be masters, nor all masters cannot be truly followed. You shall mark many a duteous knee-crooking knee knave that, doting on his own obiscuous bondage, wears out his time, much like his master's ass. So again, little subtle animalistic language here, as we previously mentioned. For naught but provender and, when he's old, cashiered. Whip me such honest knaves. Others there are who, trimmed in forms and visages of duty, keep yet their hearts attending on themselves, and throwing but shows of service on their lords, do well thrive by them. And when they've lined their pocket, their coats do omit themselves homage. 
and he's saying here that this is his view of of people that no one's good really everybody's self-serving everybody is out for themselves they're out to line their coats uh, in other words there's a focus on money and this of course reveals his personal beliefs these fellows have some soul and such a one do i profess myself so i am like this for sir it is sure as you are rodrigo were i the more i would not be iago and here we've got a bit of kind of flipping of identity again this is something that he does a lot and um, he confuses people about who they truly are um, and then says in following him i follow but myself very closely linked to that uh, phrase at the top of the page about his self-centeredness heaven is my judge not i for love and duty but seeming so for my peculiar end for when my outward action doth demonstrate the native act and figure of my heart in compliment extern tis not long after but I will wear my heart upon my sleeve for doors to peck at. A uh, key quotation here as well. Uh, again, we've got animalistic language, but I will wear my heart upon my sleeve. It's quite a famous phrase, that. But then we get that enjambment uh, with the next line, for doors to peck at. And he's kind of suggesting here, look, I'll be seemingly open on the outside, um, but actually, you know, I've got my inner motives are, are very evil. And then we get this line, I am not what I am, which is a direct reference to the Bible. It's a biblical illusion, we call that, which is where obviously Shakespeare does this a lot. He was um, around when the King James Bible was translated in 1611. Um, but in the book of Exodus, um, there's a line which God says where he says, um, I am what I am. And it's revealing the, the identity of God. So by inverting this, um, Shakespeare is revealing that Iago is kind of the devil. He's the op opposite of God. Um, he is that, that malcontent. And then Rodrigo says, what a full fortune does the thick lips owe if he can carry it thus. So there we get some outright racism there. Uh, and I think Shakespeare is doing this to reveal it's not just Iago, it's kind of systemic, it's everywhere. Iago says, call up her father, rouse him, make after him, poison his delight. Now we get references to poison throughout the play. Um, now in particular here, uh, it's slight and subtle, but as the play progresses, it will grow much like the poison that Iago has grows. And this is a technique that Shakespeare uses a lot. He uses it in Macbeth, for example. He'll mention swelling and gall and things like that. Proclaim him in the streets, incense a kingsman, and though he in fertile, fertile climate dwell, plague him, there it is again, with flies, though that he, his joy be joy, yet throw such changes of vexation on it as he may lose some colour. So he's saying, look, get Brabantio, Desdemona's um, father, and poison him with your words, poison what you know should be a joyous thing. Rodrigo says, here is a father's house. I'll call aloud. Oh, it's very convenient, isn't it? That they're right outside Rodrigo's house. Uh, Iago says, do, like with timorous accent and dire, yell as when by night and negligence the fire is spied in populous cities. So he's saying, yes, yeah, shout it as if there's a fire in the streets. You know, and here he is just manipulating Rodrigo. And Rodrigo says, what ho, Brabantio, Signor Brabantio, ho. Um, awake, what ho, Brabantio, thieves, thieves, thieves. You know, that repetition he's using, he's trying to incite panic. Look to your house, your daughter, your bags, thieves, thieves. So he is insinuating that he's been robbed. And of course, he's saying, yes, you have been robbed. Your daughter's been taken off you. Enters Brabantio from a window above. What is the reason for this terrible summons? What's the matter there? Rodrigo says, Signor, is all your family within? Are your doors locked? Why, wherefore, ask you this? Zounds, sir. You're robbed for shame. Now, there's a bit of zounds. It's like um, um, a bit of heresy. It's a um, kind of it's 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 um, kind of swearing really. And he's using a lot of this base language uh, from the Shakespearean era. He says, "For shame, put on your gown." And he's using lots of imperatives, commands. He's telling him what to do. Your heart is burst. You have lost half your soul. Even now, now, very now, an old black ram is tupping your white you. I'm sure your teachers will have picked up on this particular line. And, and there's so much to, to mine out of this. Obviously, you've got the juxtaposition of black and white and the, the racism. You've got the, um, the the base language of tupping, um, fornicating. You've got the, the repetition of now three times over to incite that panic again. Um, so, yeah, lots and lots to pick out from there. Arise, arise, awake the snorting citizens with the bell. We should know the, ref the significance of bells from Macbeth. 
or else the devil will make a grandsire of you. Arise, I say. So there's that hellish language, and he uses that throughout. Many references to hell in contrast to Othello, who makes many references to heaven. Rabantio says, what have you lost your wits? Most reverend signor, do you know my voice? Now he is in contrast to Iago's bass language, his, his you know, very kind of uh, low language. We've got the higher language of Rodrigo, who is... Um, you know, quite eloquent here. And he's tr- it's a bit of a good cop, bad cop kind of move. Uh, not I, what are you? My name is Rodrigo. The worse a welcome. I have charged thee not to haunt about my doors. He knows him. <laughs> uh, in honest plainness, thou hast heard me say my daughter is not for thee. And now in madness, being full of supper and distempered drought, uh, upon mal- uh, malicious knavery, dost thou come to start my choir. So he's saying, I, I know who you are. I know you've been after my daughter and I've already told you to back off. But this, of course, is um, his way in with Desdemona, who he's in love with. And Iago is helping him to do this. So through this scene here, we're seeing lots of um, examples of Iago's speech. Then we see uh, Rodrigo's panic. Sir, sir, sir. And he's um, he's interrupted by Brabantio, which is a a sign of, of, of authority. You know, and Brabantio says, but thou must needs be sure my spirit and my place have in them power to make this bitter to thee. So he's threatening Rodrigo, essentially. Look, I've got power and it's shown um, physically on the stage because Brabantio is from a high window and that's to emphasize his high status. Rodrigo says, patience, good sir. What tells me of robbing? This is Venice. My house is not a grange. And so he's, you know, reinstating the um, the setting here. Venice was known as a place of, of order, um, a place of sophistication. Uh, and that's why Shakespeare sets it in Venice originally. Now, as we move on, we go from Venice uh, to Cyprus, where it's much more chaotic. It's an island which covered by sea, which represents disorder. Um And then Rodrigo says, most grave Brabantio, in simple and pure soul, I come to you. And then in direct contrast, we have Iago. So we've again have this juxtaposition of the the, the, um, almost sycophantic, like, you know, he's trying desperately to please uh, uh, Brabantio. Then Iago says, Zound, sir, you're one of those that will not serve God if the devil bid you. So being provocative um, and again using heresy. Because we come to do you service and you think we're ruffians. You'll have your daughter covered in a Barbary horse. You'll have your nephews nay to you, and you'll have courses for cousins and genets for Germans. So he's using humour here uh, to mock Brabantio. Uh, again, with that animalistic language saying that um, her daughter, uh, because um, she's with a horse, so he's being uh, derogatory towards Othello, um, therefore have her, hus- her nephews nay to you. So he's trying to provoke a reaction out of Brabantio. What profane wretch art thou? So he's recognizing him for who he is. He's a wretch. He's profane. Um, But he still says, you know, art thou? He still has his kind of um, high level speech here. Iago says, I am one, sir, that comes to tell you, your daughter and the more are now making the beast with two backs, which again is that coarse sexual language that he's not afraid of using deliberately to be provocative. Rubantio says, thou art a villain. Iago, you are a senator. Now, again, he's mocking literally the the form of of his words uh, and the rhythm thou art a villain you are a senator but notice the difference of thou and you thou would be used much more as a kind of um open term you is more accusationary and it's it's something you'd use in in anger again coarse prose like language brabantio says this thou shalt answer i know thee rodrigo sir i will answer anything so again you can see that brabant uh, Rodrigo is deliberately there to juxtapose Iago so that Iago looks even more villainous in contrast. So before we move on to scene two then, where we'll uh, meet Othello, let's look at Othello's language and what we can expect. So Othello is far more emotive. He feels things and uses emotion, not to manipulate, but to persuade. So think of him as like an eloquent speaker, um, you know, like a Winston Churchill, someone who's able to persuade people with his speech. He's calm and he's confident. He speaks in short, clear sentences, imperatives or commands, very similar to um, Macbeth at the start of the play. 
He speaks in dignified blank verse, which is eloquent, poetic, well-structured, often in iambic pentameter, so uh, ten um, kind of ten syllables uh, with iams kind of double stressed, da 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 da, emphasizing just his his how well spoken he is in contrast to Iago, who speaks in prose. He often refers to the imagery of sea or of heavens, which reflects perhaps his overreaching or boundless ideals. The fact that, you know, he can see to the ends of the earth. He's got this big picture um, thinking. But it could also represent the later chaos and uncertainty because obviously storms with the sea and with the sky. So later on, his language will become chaotic and will show signs of madness. And his language will become, over time, more and more like Iago's until we get to kind of Act 3, where they're just so similar in the way they speak, you can't tell them apart. He'll use more obscenities, more animalistic language. His sentences will become fragmented and broken, and he'll become violent. And the only time that it returns back to his former majesty is right at the end of the play, when he has that moment of realisation um, of, of what he's done with Desdemona and that moment of catharsis. And then he gets that final kind of burst of who he was before, before he ends up, um, spoiler alert, uh, killing himself. So let's take a look at Act 1, Scene 2, where we have the, the introduction of Othello. And as we know from um, other poem, um, Shakespeare texts that we might have studied, the protagonist entering is a very important moment, and it'll often symbolise the kind of character they'll be. So we're in another street. Again, we're in Venice, a place which is um, well-structured and well-organised, representing the mindset of Othello. And it says, enter Othello Iago and attendants with torches. So the torches indicate that it's a nighttime setting. So we're getting a sense of secrecy and mystery, obviously foreshadowing what takes place later with the malcontent Iago. And Iago starts and we're, we're entering into the scene in the middle of a conversation. Um, and so Iago says, though in the trade of war I've slain men, yet do I hold it in the very stuff of conscience not to do no contrived murder. I lack iniquity sometimes to do me service. Nine or ten times I'd have thought to have yerked him here under the ribs. So Iago immediately establishes his duplicity because we've just heard about his kind of how he's um, serving Othello to, um, just for his own gain. And yet here he is saying, uh, I don't think I could ever murder someone, you know, which, which we know isn't his, um, his nature. And then Othello says the line, "'Tis better as it is." Now, this is his first line in the place, which is significant. And his first line is a clear and direct, um, abrupt, powerful statement. And this is how he begins and how he continues, at least in the start, to speak. He speaks in these clear statements just to exert his dominance, not in a, not in a kind of overt way, but just in a subtle way to say, I'm in charge, I'm in command. Um, kind of in contrast to Rodrigo, who was saying small bits and pieces, but constantly being interrupted. And then Iago says, nay, but he prated and spoke such scurvy and provoking terms against your honour, that with a little godliness I have, I did full hard forbear him. But I pray, sir, are you fast married? For be sure of this, that the Magnifico is much beloved and hath in his effect a voice potential, as double as the Duke's, he will divorce you or put upon you what restraint and grievance the law, with all its might to enforce it on, will give him cable." And so this is Iago essentially trying to provoke uh, Othello and saying, look, Brabantio, you know, he knows about your marriage to Desdemona. He's going to cause all sorts of problems for you. And again, look at Othello's uh, calm and controlled response. Let him do his spite. My services uh, shall speak for me. So he is, again, calm and controlled. He's not panicked. Now, obviously, this is subverted later in the play. But none of Iago's attempts... Uh, to get under Othello's skin are working. You know, he's giving these, it is better as it is, let him do his spite type phrases. And then, which, when I know the boasting is an honour, I shall prelimigate. I fetch my life and being from men of royal siege, and my Demetrius may speak unbonneted as to a proud fortune as this that I have reached. For I know Iago, but that I love the gentle Desdemona. So look at the affectionate language he's using here, the gentle Desdemona. Often in Shakespeare's plays, we get a, a label, uh, a tag label of like, you know, uh, brave Macbeth, honest Iago, gentle Desdemona. I would not 
my unhoused free condition put into circumscription and confined for the sea's worth. Again, look at that mention of the sea, as we mentioned earlier, open language, kind of vast and uh, kind of wide as his ambitions are in a, in a positive way. But look what lights come yond, those that are raised father and his friends. And then Iago says, you were best go in. Again, Othello, not I, I must be found. Look how many times Iago's trying to direct Othello and how every time he's refuted by Othello. It's better as it is. Let him do his spite. Not I, I must be found. And again, this is this is the extent of Othello's self-belief. He knows himself. He knows he's honest. He knows he's true. And so he's therefore open, uh, like the streets of Venice, uh, like the sea, like the heavens. My part, my title, and my perfect soul shall manifest me rightly. I would suggest this would be a, a good quotation to learn. Um, it tells us a lot about his character. He's not arrogant, but he does know who he is. My perfect soul. He knows that he's right and righteous at this point. Is it they? By Janus, I think no. Now, this is an important line again from Iago. By Janus. Now, Janus was a, a, a god, but he was a two-faced god. Um, had two faces op uh, facing opposite ways. And obviously Shakespeare has chosen this deliberately to represent the duplicitous two-faced nature of Iago. So that's an important line. Enter Cassio and officers with torches. The servants of the Duke and my lieutenant, the goodness of the night upon you, friends. What's the news? Look at the way he speaks. Uh, calls them friends. The goodness of the night upon you. He's very socially aware and he's very um, kind of uh, polite and well-mannered and well-spoken. And this is uh, a trope of, of Othello's speech throughout the opening of the play. The Duke does not greet you, General, and he requires your haste, post-haste appearance, even on the instant. Again, trying to, you know, there's this sense of, of panic from everybody else except for Othello. What is the matter, think you? Something from Cyprus, as I may divine. It is a business of some heat. The galleys have sent a dozen sequent messengers this very night at one another's heels, and many of the councils raised and met are at the Duke's already. You have been hotly called for. When being not at your lodgings, we found the Senate have sent the several quests to search you out. Now look at the mentions of heat here. We get um, lots of mentions. We've got the torches. Um, we've got the um, the mention of the business of some heat there. And, and even hotly called for. So there's a sense of heating up, of tension, and uh, but Othello's not rising to this. He's cool and calm and collected. Tis well I'm found by you. So you know, he's, he's welcoming this, uh, this party coming towards him. I will but spend a word here in the house and go with you. So very important the way that Othello is characterized initially as it sets him up for the ultimate downfall. It creates that sense of contrast when we do find that he becomes this horrific character it's even more tragic because of how he was initially characterized so now we get to see um, brabantio coming towards othello and his accusations which is very interesting because we remember how brabantio was initially kind of um more upset about Ca uh, about rodrigo and we're going to see how very quickly the poison of iago has worked its its way into brabantio's thinking so Cassius says, I do not understand, Iago. He's married. To who? Enter Othello. Married to... Come, Captain, will you go? Now, look what Iago's done there, obviously deliberately. He's interrupted himself um, as a kind of deception. He's trying to get that sense of um, intrigue from Cassio. Have with you. Here comes another troop to seek for you. Is Brabantio, General. Be advised. He comes to bad intent. So here's Iago again being provocative, He's telling Othello, look, he's come for bad intentions. Be advised, be on, on your guard. And then enter Brabantio, Rodrigo and officers with torches and weapons this time. So we've got an obvious sense of threat here. Holler, stand there. Look at his, again, direct imperative language speaking in commands. Rodrigo says, Senor, it is the more. Again, this derogatory language towards him. Brabantio says, down with him, thief. Now notice the word thief here. He is now repeating the language that Iago initially spoke to him. Remember when Iago said, there are thieves at your door, and now Brabantio is using that same language. This same technique will later work on Othello. Othello will begin repeating Iago's phrases until ultimately he sounds just like Iago. 
both sides draw swords. You, Rodrigo, come, sir, I am for you. Now look at this act he's playing. We know that he is actually for Rodrigo in the sense of he's on his side. But here we've got this kind of play on words, I'm for you, you know, I'm coming after you. So it's all just an act. Keep up your bright swords for the dew will rust them. So he is in charge here and he's telling everybody to back down. Good senor, you shall more command with years than your weapons. So we've got the sense of his wisdom here. He's saying, look, your experience is far more powerful than the weapons you hold. And so again, we're getting this sense of um, of his character here. Brabantio, O oh, foul thief, where hast thou stowed my daughter? Damned as thou art, thou hast enchanted her. So he is here uh, insinuating he's used some kind of magic on her. And he doubts here that he could ever you know, naturally um, win his daughter. So there's a sense of the prejudice here for AO3, the context, the prejudice of the society at the time. Well, of course, it must be some kind of enchantment. And damned, we've got that hellish language that, again, Iago was using earlier. For I'll refer me to all things of sense, if she is in chains of magic were not bound, whether a maid so tender, fair and happy, so opposite to marriage that she shunned the wealthy, curled darlings of our nation. So he's essentially saying here, look, she was never, she never wanted to be married, and all the wealthy, curled darlings of our nation, all these other men far more suited than you have come along. Um, and obviously that shows the, the, the power of their love and, and, and their connection would ever have to incur a general mock, run from her guardage to the sooty bosom of such a thing as thou. Now look at the objectification of um, of Othello here, the way that he's being described uh, of such a thing, sooty bosom, again, that derogatory racist language that he's using here. To fear, not to delight. Judge me the world if tis not a gross incense that thou hast practised on her with foul charms, abused her delicate youth with drugs or minerals that weaken motion. So clearly it must be some kind of uh, magic he's used. And again, that's prejudice because he's uh, insinuating that because of his um, his heritage, it must be something to do with magic. I'll have disputed on, tis probable and palpable to thinking. I therefore apprehend and do attach thee for an abuser of the world, a practiser of arts inhibited and out of warrant. Lay hold upon him. If you do resist, subdue him at his peril. Take hold of him. Uh, let's arrest him. And Othello says, hold your hands. Both of you, mine inclining and the rest, the control he's got here. Were it in my cue to fight, I should have known it without a prompter. Where will you go that I to answer this, your charge? He is after justice here. Um, in, and again, he's, he's an advocate of justice and we're meant to see him in that light. To prison, till fit time of law and course of direct session, call thee to answer. What if do obey? How may the Duke be therewith satisfied whose messengers are here by my, about my side upon some present business of the state to bring him in? Tis true, most worthy signor, the Duke's in control of your, and your noble self, I'm sure, is sent for. Look at the way the officer's speaking about Othello. Most worthy signor, your noble self, even in, as he's being accused of this crime. And, and remember the, the crime here of witchcraft is even more significant given the time of production um, in terms of the, um, the the religious society. Witchcraft was seen as a, um, a real a kind of heretical thing. And, and so um, for the, the audience at the time, this would be even, even more drastic. But for the officer, his reputation precedes him. How the Duke in my control, in my council, Duke in council rather, in this time of the night, bring him away. Mine's not an idle cause. The Duke himself or any of my brothers of the state cannot but feel this wrong as twere their own. For if such actions may have passage free, bond slaves and pagans our statesmen be. And as we know, Shakespeare likes to end a scene on a rhyming, on a kind of a couplet here, like free and be, to emphasize that Brabantio is of high status. Again, look at the language he's using. And again, that that kind of accentuates the difference in social position of Othello to Brabantio and how even more he's unsuited uh, uh, from a social standpoint from his daughter. So before we move into scene three, just a quick um, thing about AO2 in particular. I want to focus on this as we go into the next scene um, because AO2, it says, 
uh, requires students to analyze ways in which meanings are shaped in literary texts, with particular focus on the structures of texts as a form of shaping. Now, notice the emphasis on structure here, which is why during the GCSE, when you did have a question on structure and more focus on the structure of texts, that's why it set you up really well. However, at GCSE, we'd be more focused on language, whereas at A level, yeah, language is still is still important, but structure is very important when it comes to A level. And when we say structure, we don't just mean structural devices, but we mean the shape of texts. We mean, for example, how the text moves from open space to closed space. We'd look at the, as we've done already, the speech that Iago gives and the extent of that speech in contrast to the short bursts of speech. Uh, of Rodrigo. So just as a quick thing as we move into uh, scene three, this is something we're going to be looking at in particular, AO2 with a focus on structures of text as a form of shaping. So I want to pick up uh, Act 1, Scene 3 with this very important extract, um, in particular with the emphasis on Othello as a character. Now this is a, a famous speech that Othello gives and it's really useful in terms of identifying his character. So They've come to the Duke and uh, raised their case against Othello to the Duke. The Duke says to Othello, what in your own part can you say to this? So he's inviting Othello now to uh, respond to his accusers. And Brabantio says, nothing, but this is so. So, you know, it's very clear, as we saw from scene two, the language he was using, which was emulating Iago, um, just how adamant um, Brabantio is about Othello's guilt. And then Othello finally gets a chance to speak. He says, most potent, grave and reverend signors. Now think about how he opens this speech very eloquently. Um, and, you know, it's, it's in iambic pentameter, which we've already talked about. This blank verse, which emphasizes that eloquence of which he speaks. My very noble and approved good masters, that I have taken away this old man's daughter. It is most true. True, I've married her. The very head and front of my offending hath, to this extent, no more. So he's saying, you're totally right. I have married Desdemona. He says, rude am I in my speech and little blessed with the soft phrase of peace. Now, this is an ironic statement because he's saying here he's not a very good speaker. And yet, as he's speaking, we can clearly hear as an audience that he actually is. So he's using a bit of false humility um, but he's also shows his, hum his you know, how he is humble, but very persuasive. Look, I'm not very good at speaking, but I'll try my best. And he is winning them over to him. For since these arms of mine of seven years pith, till now some nine moons wasted, they have used their dearest action and in the tented field. And little of this great world can I speak, more than pertains to feats of broil and battle. So again, this is him uh, being humble but also a little bit of a boast, a little bit of pride. You know, I can't speak of anything except for broils and battles. It's kind of saying, I don't know anything about the world, you know, except for all the wars I've won. So you could argue there's a bit of hubris here, there's a bit of pride here, and that could be the debate, the AO5 here. And therefore, little shall I grace my cause in speaking for myself. Yet by your gracious patience, again appealing to them, I will ra a round unvarnished tale deliver. So I'm about to tell you about what I've done. It's an unvarnished tale. So it's, you know, I haven't really um, spent a lot of time working on it and, and making it sound good, which is again ironic. Of my whole course of love, what drugs, what charms, what conjuration and what mighty magic for such procedures, I am charged with all. I won his daughter. So he's essentially admitting, yes, I did use magic. But what he's going to go on to say is, I used the magic of love. <laughs> so he's being kind of similar to Iago, provocative, but in a different way. But do also notice, I won his daughter. There is a subtle objectification here, which shows how this runs through um, culture and society at the time, even though Othello is far more progressive than the other characters, and that the relationship between his and him and Desdemona start anyway is one of more equality there's still that subtle objectification Rubantio says a maiden never bold of spirit so still and quiet that her motion bluster herself and she in spite of nature of years of country credit everything to fall in love with what she feared to look on 
And so here we have that Elizabethan perspective of prejudice. He's assuming that she would fear to look upon Othello because of the color of his skin and because of his background. It is a judgment maimed and most imperfect that will confess perfection could err, so could err against all rules of nature, and must be driven to find out practices of cunning hell why this should be. I therefore vouch again that with some mixtures powerful over the blood, or with some dam dram conjured to this effect, he wrought upon her. So he's saying once again, he's reinforcing the point, he must have used some kind of magic or, or powers of hell. <clears throat> and then the Duke says, to vouch this is no proof without more wider and more overt, overt test than these thin habits and poor likelihoods of modern seeming do prefer against him. So the Duke's being quite, you know, uh, practical, saying, well, there's no evidence of this. And the senator says, but Othello, speak. Did you by indirect and forced courses subdue and poison this young maid's affections, or came it by request and such fair question as soul to soul affordeth? So they once again turn to Othello, who says, I do beseech you, Send for the lady to the secretary and let her speak of me before her father. If you, if you do find me foul of it in her report, the trust, the office I do hold of you, not only take away, but let your sentence even fall upon my life. Now, this is the level of trust he has in Desdemona that he would say, ask her yourself and you'll find out. Uh, and, he's, and, and again, shows the equality and trust within their relationship. Duke says, fetch Desdemona hither. Ancient, conduct them. You know best know the place and exits Iago and the officers to fetch her. And till she comes, true as to heaven, I do confess the vices of my blood, so justly to your gravy as I'll present how I did thrive in this fair lady's love and she in mine. Because I'll tell you now how we came to, to be together. Uh, and again, look at the, the references to, to heaven he's making in contrast to the early inventions of hell that Brabantio was making, this juxtaposition here. Say it, Othello. Her father loved me, often invited me, still question me the story of my life from year to year, the battles, sieges, fortunes that I have passed. So he says, her father loved me, past tense, obviously, because no longer loves her, uh, no longer loves him. And it shows the power of Iago, the influence of Iago, uh, that it's not taken that long for his love to change. And, and the reason he loved him is he loved hearing of his stories. Uh, I ran it through even from my boyish days to the very moment that he bade me tell it, when I spake of most disastrous chances, of moving accidents by flood and field, of hairbreadth scapes in the imminent deadly breach, of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery, of my redemption thence and portents in my travelled histories, wherein of antres vast and deserts idle, rough quarries, rocks and hills whose heads touch heaven, it was my hint to speak. Such was my process. So this is the adventure of his life. And his story is so compelling that that story wins him over to uh, Brabantio. And so Othello continues his tale and says, Of the cannibals that each eat other eat, and the anthropomagi, the men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. Now, it could be that he's exaggerating here because we know that these things don't exist. Um, however, it could also be just, you know, the, the Elizabethan era, there was beliefs that such people existed. So it could be Shakespeare's drawing off folklore and, and myth. This to hear were Desdemona seriously inclined. So Desdemona's listening into this story. But still the house affairs would draw her thence, whichever as she could with haste dispatch, she'd come again and with a greedy ear devour up my discourse. So her ear is greedy. She wants to hear more and more about... Um, his life, which I observing took once in a pliant hour and found good means to draw from her a prayer of earnest heart. Now look how even before we meet Desdemona, Shakespeare's establishing her piety, her purity, how she's an innocent character. She's praying and prayer of earnest heart that I would all my pilgrimage dilate, whereof by parcels she had something heard, but not intentively. I did consent, and often did beguile her of her tears, when I did speak of some distressful stroke that my youth suffered. So he's drawing off her um, sympathy. And that's kind of the way he um, persuaded her, I suppose, um, in, into a relationship, rather than the manipulation that Iago would use. Iago would use lies um, to get what he wants, whereas Othello's using the truth. He's using his story. My story being done, she gave me for my pains, a world of sighs, 
She swore in faith to a strange, to as passing strange, was pitiful, to as wondrous pitiful. She wished she had not heard it, yet she wished that heaven made her such a man. Now look at the subtle subtlety of Desdemona. She's meant to be this innocent character, but as we read, she's not quite that innocent. Um, it's quite um, character in false characterization. She's just innocent and pure and naive, because look at how she's saying, "Wish that heaven made her such a man." She's implying to Othello that he is that man. She thanked me and bade me that if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story and that would woo her. So she's giving him a hint. And he says, upon this hint, I spake she loved me for the dangers I passed and I loved her that she did pity them. This is the only witchcraft I have used. So the power in Othello is the power of his storytelling, the power of his eloquence and his words. This is his true power. Uh, it's not a witchcraft, and it might be a subtle reference to Shakespeare himself. The power of Shakespeare is in his words and his storytelling, and it's almost like a magic. Here comes the lady. Let her witness it. Enters Desdemona, Iago in attendance. I think this tale would win my daughter too, good Brabantio. You know, so Duke's being, the Duke's being convinced. Take up this mangled matter at the best. Men do their broken weapons rather use than their bare hands. I pray you hear her speak. If she confesses that she was half the wooer, Destruction is on my head, and if my bad blame do you perceive in all this company, where most you owe obedience. So you can see Brabantio is already being convinced by Othello. My noble father, I do perceive here a divided duty. So look at the way she's begun, exactly like Othello, so they are mirroring each other's speech. My noble father, but she sees a divided duty. So she's she's kind of got this inner conflict of a duty towards her father but also a duty towards her husband. To you I'm bound uh, for life and education. My life and education both do learn me how to respect you. You're the lord of duty. I am Hivro, your daughter. But he is my husband, and so much duty as my mother show to you, preferring you before her father, so much I challenge that I may profess due to the more my lord. So she's, confess she's professing her love for him. Goodbye, I've done. Please, your grace, on to the state affairs, I'd rather adopt a child than get it. Now, look at what's happened here. First of all, goodbye, I've done. He's been defeated. It didn't take long, but he's kind of uh, accepted what she said. But then he says, I'd rather adopt a child than get it. So he's kind of, and he'll do this again in a moment, but he's kind of hinting that he wished he'd never had a child because it's, it's so much stress for him. Come hither more, I here do give thee that which all my heart, which but thou hast already with all my heart, would keep from thee. For your sake, Jewel, I am glad at soul I have no other child, for thy escape would teach me tyranny. So again, I'm glad I only I have one child because one's enough stress for me here. To hang clogs on him I've done, my lord. Let me speak like yourself and say a sentence which, as a grace or step, may help these lovers into your favour. So the Duke's going to bestow his wisdom. When remedies are past, the griefs are ended by seeming the worst which late on hopes depended. To mourn a mischief that is past and gone next way to draw a, mis a new mischief on which cannot be preserved when fortune takes patience in her injury and mockery makes this rob that smiles steals something from the thief he robs himself that spends a bootless grief and i notice the rhyming couplets here indicating that what's said must therefore be wise because it rhymes and brabantio says so let the turk of cyprus us beguile we lose it not so long as we can smile he bears the sentence well that nothing bears but uh, the free comfort which from thence he hears. But uh, he bears both the sentence and the sorrow that to pay grief must of poor patients borrow. Now, often when you see rhyming couplets, it's kind of addressed to the audience. It's Shakespeare's method of, of uh, kind of addressing us and bestowing his wisdom on us through the vehicle of a character. And that's kind of your AO2 and your AO3, the context mixed together. And so I just want to pick up this... Um, very important part of the text here in Act 1, Scene 3, where the Duke kind of sums up everything and then we move into Iago and Rodrigo again. So the Duke says, Let it be so, good night to everyone, and noble signor. If virtue no delighted beauty lack, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. So he's kind of giving him a backhanded compliment here. Your son-in-law is more fair than black, fair meaning light, but also meaning, you know, he's, he's a good person. And so it's subtle racism here, but he's kind of indicating there's more to Othello than the way he appears. And then Senator says, I adieu, brave more, use Desdemona well. 
Look to her more. If thou hast eyes to see, she has deceived her father and may thee. Now, this is an important line here because it's the seed of doubt. It's that moment that, remember, that Iago hears this and he's picking up on this. He's saying he's this. De- you know, Desdemona is deceptive. She's deceived her own father and may thee. And this will be the thing that Iago picks up and uses because the previous uh, techniques didn't work on Othello. Exit Duke, Brabantio, Cassio, senators and officers. My life upon her faith, honest Iago. Now, honest Iago is repeated throughout this play 43 times. It's that reinforcement of their uh, naivety about Iago. that he, That's his label, honest Iago. My Desdemona must I leave to thee. Again, look at that that trust he's putting uh, in Iago. Uh, but also the possessive pronoun my, again, indicates that AO3 social context. I prithee, let thy wife attend on her and bring them after the best advantage. Come, Desdemona, I have but an hour of love, of worldly matter and discretion to spend with thee. We must obey the time. And so off they go, two lovers together. And then we're left with Iago and Rodrigo. And Rodrigo says, Iago! You know, because he's saying, your plan clearly didn't work. What sayst thou, noble heart? What will I do, thinkst thou? Why, go to bed and sleep. He says, just sleep it off. I will incontinently drown myself. Now, Rodrigo is such a pathetic character that he almost acts as a comic relief. He's there to relieve the tension with his kind of wet kind of responses here. If thou does, I shall never love thee after. Why, thou silly gentleman? It is silliness to live when to live is torment. And then we have the prescription to die when our death is our physician. He wants to die because he's in love with Desdemona and he knows now he has no chance because he's heard the same stories. O oh, villainous, I have looked upon the world for four times seven years and since I could distinguish betwixt a benefit and an injury, I never found, found a man that knew how to love himself. Here I would say I would drown myself for the love of a guinea hen. I would change my humanity with a baboon. And look at that animalistic language he's constantly using, reminding us of his base animalistic nature, which later on Othello will take on. What should I do? I confess it is my shame to be so fond, but it is not virtue to amend it. Virtue, a fig, right? So he sees virtue and moral as nothing. Tis in ourselves that we are thus or thus. Our bodies are gardens to which our walls, our wills are gardeners. So that if we will plant nettles or sow lettuce, set hyssop and weed in time, supply it with one gender of herbs or distract it with many, either to have it sterile with idleness or manured with industry, why the power and incorrigible authority of this lies within our wills. If the balance of our lives had not one scale of reason to poise another of sensuality, the blood and baseness of our natures. That The harsh alliteration there of blood and baseness, which emphasizes his disgust would conduct to us most preposterous conclusions. But we have reason to cool our raging motions, our carnal stings, our embittered lusts, wherever I take this that you call love to be sect or scion. So he's giving his theories on love. He doesn't believe in love. He thinks that love is just kind of chemicals in the brain. And he says what you call love, which also indicates he doesn't know how to love. Which when we we meet the other, when we meet his wife, of course, we see that's true. He only ever uses her Um, He doesn't actually um, know how to love. It cannot be. It's merely a lust of the blood and permission of the will. So that's what he thinks love is. It's just lust and you're giving up your will. Come be a man, drown thyself, drown cats and blind puppies. Look at that kind of shocking imagery he's making here of the the innocent. Come be a man. Uh, I have professed me thy friend and confessed me knit to thy deserving with cables of perundal toughness. I could never better stead than now. Put money in thy purse. Follow thou these wars. Defeat thy faith with an usurped beard. I say, put money in thy purse. Now look at the yellow here. Look how many times he's going to say, put money in thy purse. He's telling him, get some money. I need funding for what I'm about to do. And the subtlety of it is he just keeps subliminally mentioning through this repetition that he needs him to get some money. Put money in thy purse, nor he is to her. It was a violent commencement, and thou shalt see an unanswerable sequestration. But put money in thy purse. These moors are changeable in their wills. Now, he's establishing the stereotype here of kind of women and black men at the time. He's saying, oh, these moors, this is their nature, changeable in their wills. He's othering him so that they can then control him. Fill thy purse with money. The food that is to him is now as luscious as locusts shall be sortly as bitter as Coluntria. 
He must change. She must change for youth. So again, she, she's obviously going to change as she gets older. Why would she still be in love with him as she becomes wiser? When she's sated with his body, she'll find the error of her choice. She must have change. She must. Again, look how um, practical he is in mind. And he thinks, well, once she's done with his body, nothing to do with love because he doesn't understand love. He thinks, oh, well, she'll eventually be bored of him. Therefore, put money in thy purse. If thou wilt needs damn thyself, do it more delicate than way than drowning. Make money if thou canst. Now look at the way he's speaking. This is all in prose here. The difference between the way that Othello or even Desdemona speaks, where it looks more like a poem on the page. This just looks like um, just speech, just dialogue, just normal everyday talk. If sanctimony and frail vow betwixt an erring barbarian and super subtle Venetian be not too hard for my wits and all the tribe of hell, thou shalt enjoy her. Th therefore make money a pox on drowning thyself. It is a clean out of the way. Seek thou rather to be hanged in the company thy joy than be drowned and go without her. And then Rodrigo says, Wilt thou be fast to my hopes if I depend on the issue? Thou art sure of me, go make money. Again, just I think probably about seven times he mentions that. I have told thee often and will retell thee again and again, I hate the more. Now, this is an important line that he says, I hate the more, because we never really understand why he does. Um, he has He's a malcontent, but he seems to have no motive. So we call him the motiveless malcontent. Uh, is it jealousy? Is it that he's been overstepped for a promotion? Uh, is it racism? It's just because he's a bad egg. you know. And so he's therefore called by some critics, the motiveless malcontent.